ingenuity. Welcome, Taryn. Hi, Marina. Thanks so much for having me. Super excited to be here. It's flight night. Woo! Yes, it's flight night. You had an integral part with the helicopter team. Can you tell us about your role? Yeah, so I'm a mechanical engineer, and I helped in the assembly, integration, and testing of the Ingenuity vehicle. And it was really important that we simulate a Mars-like atmosphere in our testing. And in doing so, we knew it would give us the best chance to execute a real flight on Mars. And that's not an easy feat. Flying on Mars is much different than flying on Earth. Very difficult. It's less than 1% of Earth's atmosphere, making it very difficult to fly and generate enough lift. So, Taryn, what is the Ingenuity team preparing for right now? What are they waiting to see? We're waiting to see data confirming that we executed our first flight. The actual flight on Mars took place earlier today, and that's because Mars is over 178 million miles away, so there's a little bit of a delay. The data is expected to hit the Deep Space Network at about 3.34 a.m. Pacific time, and we'll start processing the data shortly after that to see how we did. Fingers crossed. Thanks so much, Taryn. We'll be coming back to you shortly as we get closer to the start of the data downlink. What started out as a dream is now becoming reality for the Ingenuity helicopter team. Let's take a look at their journey. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in Mars atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has to spin very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400, 2,600. We're spinning between 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of the very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to, you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy. It has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days, so we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground, and so we will basically go up uh, about three meters, and we'll hover there, uh, and then we'll come down again, and that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, we've tested all we can on Earth. We have met models that shows how it will fly at Mars and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is now to do the real test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle's performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing even right now and it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk and None of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. Along with your cup of coffee, coffee, you can join in on the conversation by asking the helicopter team questions at NASA JPL on all social platforms by using the hashtag MarsHelicopter. We will get to your questions later on in the program.
Mimi Ong is the project manager for Ingenuity. She joins us now as they wait for the downlink to start. Welcome, Mimi. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Marina. Now, Mimi, this has been quite the journey for you and your team. How do you feel finally reaching this moment? You know, our team has been working on the Mars helicopter for over six years, and for some even longer, towards this ultimate dream of experimenting the first flight at Mars. Here we are. Yes, here we are. And last week was a little bit of a week for you guys. You've had some technical challenges. What made you decide to go ahead with the first flight attempt this morning? April 9th was a surprise. We were two days away from first flight and just onto our very last checkout, high speed spin of the rotor system. And there we discovered an intricate uh, timing issue that was preventing the helicopter from transitioning to flight mode, the mode that we need to be in to spin the rotor system high speed. So right after we found that, our team went into high gear, identified two possible solutions in a couple of days, and uh, we picked the solution that is really uh, the most simple, most straightforward option. So a note there, though, that the solution that we have adopted, uh, it does transition to the helicopter into flight mode about 85% of the time. So when we go to flight, and if we don't go into flight mode, the helicopter will stay safe, and we will attempt the first flight again. <laughs> so just last Friday, we took the solution, applied it to Ingenuity, and successfully spun Ingenuity's rotor system full speed. So next step is our first flight attempt now. And to give folks at home, Mimi, some perspective, the goal is to fly on a planet that has just 1% the atmosphere of Earth. And you're controlling that flight from over 100 million miles away. How difficult is that? Very, very difficult <laughs> to fly a rotorcraft at Mars. You know, a rotorcraft pushes the atmosphere to generate lift. And when there is that little atmosphere, the rotor system has to spin really fast. In fact, uh, we'll be spinning over 2,500 revolutions per minute for this flight today. And Ingenuity uh, is less than 1.8 kilograms, right? Four pounds. And in that four pounds, Ingenuity has to be able to fly in that very thin atmosphere and be able to survive and operate autonomously at Mars. For example, Ingenuity, our little four-pounder, has been on the surface of Mars, keeping itself warm throughout the cold nights, down to minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's been doing that every day. So on top of that, our flight experiment at Mars, we are operating it all the way back here from Earth. So yes, yeah, very challenging, but we're ready. Oh, Ingenuity is small, but it is mighty, and the team has come so far already. What other milestones has the helicopter team already achieved before this morning? Ingenuity has passed all of its milestones leading up to the first flight. So, performed perfectly during cruise, survived the drop, and has been charging itself with high good energy levels each time. It's been communicating daily to the base station and keeping itself warm. And all, with the rotor system all checked out to full speed, Ingenuity is ready to go. And at the high level for the Mars Helicopter Technology Project, uh, we have three goals that are in line with NASA's agency level objectives. The first is to demonstrate here on Earth that it is possible to fly a controlled power flight in the thin atmosphere of Mars. We've done that. The second objective is to perform that actual flight at Mars. Well, we're about to get data back very soon here on that first flight. And the third is to return data to inform engineers uh, working on designing future generations of Mars helicopter. We have received valuable information data back since we have dropped on the surface. And tonight's uh, data from the first uh, flight will be extremely important. So we're ready to go. We are ready to go. Now, what is success going to look like for you guys tonight? So there are five scenarios, okay? So if the solution we implemented successfully transitions the helicopter to the flight mode, we'll be all right. But if it doesn't transition, uh, then we will be attempting the flight again tomorrow. If we don't get to flight mode tonight, then we'll go on. Uh, when we, if we go successfully to the flight mode, there are four scenarios. Full success in flight. Second scenario could be partial success in flight. The third would be not having sufficient information, in which case we'll need more time to 
trying to determine what happened, the fourth could be failure. So whatever the outcome, we are set here to learn. And a bright future is ahead, Mimi. The risk is huge, but the reward is high. We will all be rooting for your team. Good luck. Thank you, Marina. As we get closer to the data arrival, let's talk to Tim Canham, Ingenuity Operations Lead. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Thanks, Marina. Glad to be here. Now, how does the data even get here from the helicopter to the team? Well, as they say, sometimes it's complicated, right? So the helicopter does not have a radio that can talk directly to Earth, so we need the help of the rover. As a matter of fact, the rover has an instrument on board, which is also built by the helicopter team called the Helicopter Base Station. The Helicopter Base Station has a radio which talks to the helicopter. So as you have, have heard, earlier today, the helicopter flew as it was flying, and after landed, it transferred its data to the base station. And then the rover takes the data from the base station and transmits it to an orbiter. That would be the MRO orbiter. And then the MRO orbiter turns to Earth and then sends all the data to the Deep Space Network. At that point, the Deep Space Network itself turns around, sends it to JPL and into the ground data systems. At that point, when it shows up, our team can take that data and decode it and see what happened during the flight. It sounds like it has to be well choreographed, Tim. How do you plan the first flight? It's a remote autonomous operation. What goes into the planning and the execution? Well, you know, we've done it all as a team, as we have all along. It's, it's been a challenge with COVID to be remote, but we learned new ways to, to, to work together. Uh, we're a small team, but we're a fast-moving team. We practiced all of these things over the course of the last year, from getting the data from the rover to decoding it to interpreting what it meant. And as we got to Mars, when the rover landed us safely, we were able to start our survey for Wright Field, and we found it, fortunately, right near where we landed. And so working with other instruments on the rover, like Meta with the weather instrument and ZCAM, which is this beautiful camera to take pictures, we planned our flight. The flight will be about 40 seconds long. We'll lift off, we'll pivot towards the rover, and then we'll land. It's going to be a very basic flight, just to we want to do the very uh, basic things first to make sure that we can do our flight. And then at that point, we will get all our data back and look at it. But we had to practice all those things. And we've been using this time on the surface to get familiar with the vehicle and how it operates and work around those various troubles that Mimi talked about. And the team is ready to go. And Tim, what specifically will the helicopter team be looking for as we go through this morning? So one of the great things about this helicopter is it has a very powerful processor. It's tiny, but it's powerful, and we get lots and lots of data. The processor itself is about 100 times as powerful as the processor, even on the rover. And so we get all this data, as I mentioned, that gets sent to the rover, and then the rover sends it to us. So as our downlink lead, Michael Starr, sees that data arrive in the data center, he will decode it and look for it. He will look for the successful arrival of the data. At that point, we turn the data over to Hobart Grip, our chief pilot, and he will look at the portion of the data that relates to how the flight went. There are a series of events that the helicopter sends as it transitions through each stage of the flight. And when Hobart is able to verify that the progression went as planned, then he'll turn to the actual data and look at a plot of the altimeter, which is one of the instruments used in navigation. We should see the plot of the altimeter go up to the, to the flight height and then come back down again and that will be a positive confirmation that we got it. And finally from the helicopter side we are snapping a series of black and white downward facing pictures as the helicopter commins for landing. So if everything goes well we should see some of those landing pictures and be able to look at them on the screen. So Hobart will display those as well. And then finally if all goes well there should be at the same time our data is coming down there should be data coming down from the Z-CAM instrument that I mentioned, the MassCam Z, a really powerful camera system that's going to try and capture us in flight. So if they, were the, if they were able to capture that moment of flight, then they will be able to display those images on their screen and be able to see a quick view of how the helicopter flew. That's how it's going to go. Well, Tim, we can't wait to see those photos for sure. Thank you so much and good luck to you. Thank you. We will get back to the action in
in the room in just a moment. Now joining us is Associate Administrator of NASA's Science Mission Directorate, Thomas Zerbukin, who is here at JPL for the helicopter's first test flight. Welcome, Thomas. I'm so glad to be here, Marina. Hi. 